Hi, Lawrence. Yep. Hi, Laurie. The day is Friday and it's another day on our random chat channel. Yeah, well, but that's... There is no that's... script and uh, we just tell it as it is, as it comes into our head. Well, um, for for those who've been listening for a very long time, um, they they know we just record our conversation. We don't make... Rarely we make a sort of presentation showing, you know, maybe some research or some photos or something like that, maps, models. But uh, most of the time we just get together and catch up with each other's brains and see what, see how the research is moving along. And, and so just think of it as yeah. Lawrence and I sitting around the coffee table having a chit chat. Anyway, this is part three of a three-part series on um, the fact that flat Earth is really not as simple as everybody's tried to make it out to be over the last five years or so that uh, it's been on the mainstream conspiracy yeah. game for a while. But the the uh, the systematic approach that Lawrence and I have taken over the last nearly five years has been questioning everything, even what flat earthers put out there. Uh, it all started out with questioning the flat earth society model and then maps and, and everything else. So we've come to our own conclusions and we just share them. And uh, if we spark some interest in somebody's uh, thinking, the main thing is, is that we'd like to do what uh, the classic debunkers do. And that is if we find something in the mix of the material that doesn't fit and doesn't, it is just not true, we call it out. And then we systematically go about showing you why we think it doesn't work. So, when I, you know, when I thought of this as a series for um, flat Earth is just not that simple. Um, none of the models are simple. The globe model is very complex, as we all know. We had to learn, you know, the geography and the solar system, and some of us learned about astronomy and astrology and the the all the different earth sciences. And so at the end of the day, when you jumped into flat earth as uh, a new mindset, a new worldview, you had to question everything you had previously learned about how the, you know, what the earth is and where you live. And so most people had a hard time undoing the dogma that, that the globe feeders fed us, uh, you know, throughout, throughout our childhoods and lives. And, but then they got spoon fed again, a, another form of dogma that said, oh, you live on this, you know, round disc and the ice wall and the snow globe. And it just kept piling on as you ask questions of the flat earth model. Um, if somebody gave you what sounded like a viable answer or, or, or something, oh, well, that can work. Okay, I'll go with that. And rather than question that, um, you just regurgitate it back to other new people. And that's what happened. You know, we forecast years before what I call flat earth going mainstream. Um, I forecast that, you know, oh God, I hope that this never goes on the news because it, we're gonna look, we're gonna be made a laughing stock of. And sure enough, that model was what everyone used because you gotta have a model. That's the mantra. Well, you gotta show them something. You can't just, you know, say it's flat because then when the questions start and you start answering them, it's easier just to plop down this model so that you can go there. That's what it looks like. That's how it works. And then when they start asking questions about that, um, then, you know, you jump into the flat earth community and some of the groups and, and boards and forums and so on and say, oh, I need an answer for this because I don't have one. And so someone gives you an answer. You go, hmm, okay, that sounds legit. 
And, um, you know, it's no different than going to the doctor. You go, oh, I got a pain over here. What do you think it is? And the doctor says, oh, I think it's, you know, diverticulitis. And you say, okay, and how do we treat that? And, and then someone else says, no, I don't know. That don't sound right. Maybe you should get a second opinion. So you go to another doctor and they go, oh, no, no, it's appendicitis. And so you, you know, you go through this process. You don't just jump on the first diagnosis that someone gives you. So it's much like that in going, pouring through all of the information, which Lawrence and I've done over and over for years and years. And so if we sound like we're a little bit, you know, meh, you guys don't know, or we're smarter than you, or we're more research, better researchers than you, that is not at all what we're saying. What we're saying is question it yourself, just like we did. And listen to what we came up with as another part, as another, you know, um, second opinion and see if ours doesn't sound more realistic than than the bogus one that that may be the general flatter of populations using. So anyway, that being said, uh, we're just going to do what we do. We're going to going to keep chatting about some of the new things that come in. And I noticed right off the bat on the first video that uh, part one of this series that that I downloaded um, last night or today it, immediately, you know, what do you mean there's no South Pole or what do you mean there's a South Pole? Is there a South Pole? What do you mean the sun doesn't circle in the north? What do you mean? And have you been to Alaska or Siberia or somewhere and witnessed it for yourself? No, I haven't. And I don't live in Siberia. And if you do, then you should be the one to be showing me videos, not not me having to show them, having to show something opposite to you. So um, at the end of the day, when when we speculate, which is what we're doing, which is what any scientific mind would do, right? Speculate and then find the evidence to support your speculation and form a hypothesis. And then if something comes into that uh, information that, you know, ruins the hypothesis, well, then you have to throw out what doesn't, you don't throw out what doesn't fit you throw out the hypothesis or adjust it, either one. And so it just depends on how strong the evidence is. So anyway, um, anything to add to Flat Earth is not that simple, folks, which is the title of this series, Lawrence. Anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we started all this off as, you know, newly converse to being Flat Earthers. And now we've reached the stage where, you know, the earth presents itself as flat, but it's not measurable. Um, the sun and moon don't fit. They all appear to be subjective. Um, and you cannot be modeled. So if it cannot be modeled, it's got to be a creation that is, uh, you know, in some way, I know you don't like the word, but it's a construct, it's a simulation. Um, and it's subjective wherever you go. It's, um, you know, I'm not a flat earther anymore. I'm not a globe. I'm not a flat earther. Um, I'm, a, I'm a construct, construct earth that appears to be flat, predominantly flat with a few bumps here and there. But, uh, you know, and, and the flat earth is, you know, at the time it was, you know, huge, biggest conspiracy ever, but, but now it's not. Um, because, you know, it, there's other stuff out there which interests me more, you know. I mean, the globe, you look, you look at the globe, it is beyond man to to um, make up the idea of a globe. This, that's come from somewhere else, some entities. Or, get, or they man was given it by some higher powers because man just couldn't possibly, um, you know... Um, make up all the complexities of the globe going back four or five hundred years just it just wouldn't happen so well, it's what, from what you mean what you mean is they couldn't make up the complexities of the heliocentric model yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, 
it's just so complex, you know. And but you know, we know that uh, all these ancient Mayans and whatever you know, they they knew about what was going to happen on you know thousands of years from now. They must have been a far more advanced society than 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 what they made out to be because they know they know you know they may have been a long time ago, but they know know a lot more about it than we do because they could predict when it would happen. If I said to you, "Here's a piece of paper," and sit down and tell me when the next eclipse is, you know, using what without looking at time and day or anything, you know, how long would it take you? Would you ever do it? Could you ever work it out? No, Probably I, not. No. I couldn't. No, uh, not only could you not work out the date of an eclipse, but uh, eclipses are only viewable from certain places on Earth at certain eclipses. Like, you know, they may get an eclipse in South Africa uh, that I won't see in the United States, no matter how hard I try. The, the moon is not going yeah, to no, eclipse no. for me there. And so that's part of it. Not only where, when is it going to be, where is it going to be? And um, you know, I mean, all of these things that everybody starts speculating about once they start asking questions at all, like how far away is the sun? How far away is the moon? What is the moon? What is the sun? Well, you know, all, yeah. all of these questions. Uh, and then the, the minute work. you start to ask, uh, and, you know, speculate then you're completely made fun of because then it's, you know, well, I guess you believe the moon's made out of cheese. Well, if the moon looks round and the other planets look round, then why wouldn't the earth be round? You know, I mean, it's just on and on all of these questions. So well, that's another one, Laurie. That's another one that doesn't fit. So when you mention the height of the sun, and of course there's a, you know, there's figures being bandied about in, the flat earth community about the height of the sun and of course so if you've got the speed of the sun so we know it goes across the earth in 24 hours so that would be just over a thousand miles an hour we can measure sun angles so that's giving you some more information and we know the distance across um and so you can compute using trigonometry how high it is but the problem is you can take the same measurements from a different point on earth uh, using the same information and you're going to get a different answer everywhere you go you're going to get a different answer as to the height of the sun so there's a problem isn't there uh, yeah it's not it's not stacking up well and it's not static it's not the same height yeah. everywhere all the time every day and so as it moves from north to south on its you know path during the year well it's got to be so close that, you know, it's got to be the reverse of if it's 93 million miles away, it's going to appear to be the same size, no matter what time of the year or what well, you know, distance we are from it or whatever. And so it's got to be the reverse of that when from Earth, if it's closer, um, yeah. it, is the size of it going to change that much? Well, it does a little bit. Some people have recorded what looks like bigger suns than, you know, on some days than other days and, and, and the moon, the same thing. So um, the whole idea is, is you got to get off that. You just got to get it's off that and try to figure it out, you know, in this finite sense if you want to spend the time and sit down with committees of people like they do at NASA or JPL or some science institute and everybody puts their heads together and comes up with, well, this this fits what we observe. So we'll, we'll just say that's what it is. OK, I mean, how did they ever come up with 93 million miles in the first place? How did they oh, ever yeah. come up with, you know, the speed that everything's moving, uh, all that? It's, it was by some kind of either consensus or being fed the information and accepting it, or it, it was, you know, um, so somebody came up with something that sounded pretty darn viable and their uh, leadership qualities, their intensity, all of that stuff made them sound authoritarian. And so everybody goes, hmm. Okay, I'm going to go with that. I mean, it sounds good to me. I can't argue it. 
Yeah, the, the, the information, I think it was something to do with the transit of Venus, the, the original one. There was one guy in one part of the world and one somebody else a few thousand miles away and they measured this, that and the other. And, but, and you look at what NASA come up with now, they, they, they can't explain how, how they get 93 million miles. But the sun, the sun is not, for me, it's not a physical object. It, you know, we, we do see something bright and shiny in the sky. But imagine that you can get... You're getting a rocket ship or, or an aeroplane that can, you know, and there's no, there's no barrier to leaving the construct, or what, you know, some, you know, metaphysical barrier that stops you getting out. Uh, and you could actually try and get to this. You'd never get to it. It, you, it would just always stay the same well, distance away because it's not real. Well, you know, it's, that, um, I, I, under, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, as as you travel, you know, let's say you're in a car and you're traveling for a long distance on a highway that's going east and west across the United States, for example. And you, you're, as you're traveling, you know, you look out the window and there's the sun and it just keeps being right with you. It doesn't ever seem to get behind you, even though you're going in the same direction it's going, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And there, there have been pilots who have chased the sun around the Arctic circle and, and kept up with it because it's appearing to be so close circling there. Okay. Um, and I don't know if anybody's done the same thing in this, in the Southern part, but you know, in my mind, it's, I wish that I were better at doing computer modeling because, um, and maybe someone out there in listening land can model what I'm talking about. But if you take that diamond shaped map and you plunk a pyramid over the top, a diamond shaped pyramid over the top of it, as the sun moves east and west along that peak, either below the peak or above the peak, going east and west, if it's in Cancer or if it's in Capricorn or it's going right over the, the equator, um, the farther south it is, the more it's going to appear to circle. The farther north it is, it's going to appear to circle. But over the top, it's going to follow the line. That's what a prism pyramid does to light. It's how it refracts it. And I can totally see the sun just going, you know, across the sky in, in, in whatever track it is within those three sectors. And I could see how as it would cross the hump, the opposite hump of the pyramid, that <clears throat> it would appear to circle because you've got ref reflection, refraction and reflection. But again, the problem with all of this is trying to model how it works in any kind of a three-dimensional model is, is impossible. Um, that's the reason why the globe model needs the spinning and the vortexing and the axis and the whole thing is for what we observe to work on that. But even so, people have debunked that plenty of times. Oh, well, it's the axis. Oh, it's because of the perigee or the apogee or the, you know, they come up with more and more and more descriptive terms. I'm done with all that because that's, that's not necessary to wrap your mind around the bigger picture of it being a construct. And what I mean by supernatural construct is mankind has created sciences for every kind to investigate every kind of nuance about the earth since forever. Okay. And so each one of these sciences delves into one problem or one observation or one hypothesis. And what has happened is they try to make a natural law out of it. In other words, 
when this happens, this happens every single time. That's the law. That's the law of this science. Okay. <clears throat> the supernatural part comes where the supernatural part comes in is you can't define it. You can't make a natural law out of it because it's supernatural. Okay. It's above yeah. natural. I was thinking about it today, Laurie. I was out, out thinking in the park and, um, and I thought about the DVD thing we were talking about, but then I thought, well, you know, prior to DVDs, they used to have the, the roles of these cine films, which all have these little squares, and it, it plays so many a minute. I don't know how many it is, but it goes quite fast. I mean, that's what makes people appear to move. But if you could imagine your life on a piece of this cine film, you know, and each little square represents a day of your life. So yesterday you're you're on that square over there. Today you're on this square. That one's the past. This is today. This one's tomorrow. But you're on today, okay? And you're living today, um, but you're still on yesterday's. You still that piece of film's still there. It's just past, but it's still there. And the one tomorrow is already there. You just haven't got there yet. And in the set, if you if you exchange that piece of city film for um, the earth realm and each one represented the earth well this is today this is tomorrow this is the day after that's yesterday and obviously the sun moves across this city film um, Hold on a minute. Maybe... I want to make sure that I understand what you're saying you're saying cine c-i-n-e cine film cinema film or city. You know, the old film, the old film that was on a reel that, okay. and, and it was, it was okay. you, you know, the old, okay. you know, when they used to make the old movies, regular, you know. Okay, regular projector film that yeah. cell by cell it by was, cell, frame by frame by frame. It was, oh, it was, it was, it was little, little squares of film. film right, so all that, all this film is there. Okay. All this oh, film is there. And let's imagine your, your entire life is on this film and the day, you know, yes, yesterday when we were doing a hangout, that's there and the day before that's there and tomorrow's there but we're here on this piece of film now and then you just subjugate the earth the, the realm onto the film instead of an, on an individual basis and and then put the sun on it the sun is moved maybe the sun doesn't do a pack if it's not doing a pac-man it's just continuing onto this endless piece of film you know like they show on the zoom out of the google maps um and somehow maybe they recycle the bits once you've gone past them i don't know what they do with them if they, if they did that but that is the only other viable notion i can think of to explain what's happening because well, we know we're not a road. That discussion about the about the cd and uh privately that that was not something anybody else is privy to so we need to yeah. talk about how we arrived, how we used that as an analogy, because we were talking about if your whole life is on a CD, you've got your CD, I've got my CD, um, and all the information is already on contained on the CD. You're born, you die, it's all on there. And... You, you could, if you put it down today, you know, put the laser tracking down on it for today. Um, that that that's where you are right now. But all of the rest of it is all, all on the CD too, right? So you're just changing from the CD analogy that we we used before. You know, you and I have talked about, um, and what led us to talk about that was. You know, everything that you, everything in your life that's already happened is is still recorded in this on this CD, and everything that's going to happen in your life is also on this CD. You just haven't played that part yet. But I don't remember exactly how we got talking about that. I think we were talking about past lives, or we were talking about reincarnation, or we were talking about maybe I don't know. Is God omni? Is this how it explains how God knows everything omnipresent? Omni yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Um, I think it stems, Laurie, I think it stemmed from that. I think it was a dream. I mean, it could have been okay. an out of body experience, but I, I, this is going just only a week ago. Uh, and I had the most profound, I'll call it a dream to give it a name. And the dream was precisely 10 seconds long. And in this 10 seconds. That's the one, was, the 10 seconds. Okay. I, I, I was at the house that I was born at in in Cheshire, uh, in England. Um, I was a two-year-old boy. I was in the garden and I only saw the 10 seconds. Somebody had asked me to count to 10. And I was a young kid. I'd got, I haven't got a care in the world. I was a happy, joyous, you know, typical child. And I ran down the garden and I was in that body. I was in back in, I was back having a dream, but I was back in my two year old body, a joyful child running down the garden and counting to say, one, two, three, four. But in a child's voice, I could hear my child's voice. And, and I was unsteady on my feet because the ground was a bit uneven. So I, I was running down the garden, counting to 10. And then I got to 10. Um, and then it ended. And of course, it, it wasn't me observing myself as a two-year-old. I was back as the two-year-old, and the only analogy I could have was it, it, been, it was like a glitch, and uh, I'd been slept, you know, passed back down to a previous part of the DVD or the cine film, and I was reliving my my entire life of ten seconds back in 1960, whenever it was, when I was two years old. Um, um that was, see, it did that's scare not me. a dream and that's not a vision that's not anything anybody could explain i don't think there's a word for it it's not reincarnation it's not you know you relived it but you didn't just relive it um your your mind your consciousness went back to that place on the cd that memory and it was playing in your consciousness at that time. That's who you were, where you were. As yeah, I wasn't. Control. Yeah, uh, but that's you so see, the thing we dream. An out of body experience or any of the things that people explain all the time. You literally, your consciousness went back to that, yeah. to that place yeah. on the sea and and lived it again. Now yeah. it, and, you uh, know. Is that time travel? Maybe you, you might be able to even explain it that way, that you your consciousness time traveled back to two years old. Lots of people have yeah. no memories before five, five years old. I have vivid yeah. memories from two. And so apparently yeah. that was one of yours, too. Most people can't even retrieve yeah. that, much less go back and relive it. But here's the difference. Not only was your consciousness reliving it, but the emotions that went with it, the, ha the carefree, the happy, yeah. Yeah. I'm, counting, I'm, so, I'm so cool, I'm counting to 10 and I'm running and I'm free and I'm in the garden. I mean, you, your consciousness was also two years old, okay? Yeah. You only yeah. were able to analyze it as a, an adult as an old man <laughs> um, because you have already lived that long. Uh, if you but, had... no, but, uh, but it's like something I'd forgot. It, I mean, sometimes you'll see something that you'd forgot for years and, and then you remember it. But I, I, I can recall lots of things from being two years old. I just can't, but I didn't remember the counting to 10, but when it was happening, it was, and I got to the end. I remember doing it, but right. that's the first time I've remembered it. It was, it was freaky. But the thing with dreams now, I still have dreams, but I get this amnesia as soon as I wake up, and it's very hard to remember very much about it. And it's only the very profound dreams that I have that I can remember, like the flying. You know, as I had them. When you get a dream that repeats and repeats and repeats, right. you're going to remember it. You know, or well, anything that's freaking, I'm really freaking you out. I think I may have somehow willed my consciousness to stop dreaming because I don't, I don't dream anymore. And if I'm dreaming, 
it's going on in my subconscious and I'm, I have no memory of it whatsoever. I don't wake up from a dream. I they, don't, I they don't wipe dream. your mind, Laurie. Hmm? I'm pretty sure they wipe your Somehow we, we are given amnesia after the dreams because I was having a very interesting dream last night. Uh, and, and, but as soon as I woke up, I can only vaguely remember the last part of it and the rest of it, it just all went. And you wanted you know, to, you really wanted but that to was, remember that, it. And that was just from a few hours ago. And I, I just, it had gone. It was like somebody had given me a, a shot of whatever, sodium pentothal or what, what, oh, some kind of drug and, to wipe and, my mind. And in the total opposite of that, of me, can't remember dreams, don't even think I'm having any, okay? Um, Jimmy, my boyfriend, is the total opposite. I have to listen to his dreams often because he just comes out in the morning and starts, oh my gosh, you, you, I had this dream and then this and that happened. And, you know, I'm rolling my eyes like, yeah, and it, you know, because dreams don't make any sense to anybody else when you try to tell them about it, especially the, the really weird dreams that don't make any sense. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to care, but I, but I don't. And, and so, you know, every once in a while I go, well, what were you wearing? Just to kind of troll him a little bit for that you left out one detail that I really need to know, but not really. It's a joke. And and so how come his dreams are so amazingly vivid for long enough after he wakes up that that he can describe the whole thing to you? Might as well just write the screenplay. I mean, he can, he, 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 he knows what temperature it was in the dream or what, he, you know, who was there and the, all of that. So it's so totally the opposite of what I experience. Um, for years, I had really horrific dreams. I mean, frightening, scary, horrible, the kind where you wake up and I mean, you can't go back to sleep until you get that shit out of your head. And I, 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 get, I, I really think I willed myself not to dream anymore so I wouldn't have nightmares. Either that, yeah. or, or either that, or I'm dreaming in dreamland with all of the other comatose people asleep all over the world, tapped into the dream factory. And, uh, but I'm, I'm, my disc wipe is working really good. And I don't remember anything when I come out of it. I don't know. Well, yeah. I'm uh, this is something I'm going to try next time I have a dream. What these dreams where you know you're dreaming, but it's still a dream. And there's all these. Most of the people I see in these dreams, I've never said, seen them before in my life in in this reality. Never met them before. But in the in 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 the dreams, it's like I've got a history with them, which is really freaky. So if I'm having another dream, uh, and I know I'm in a dream, you know what would happen if you're in a dream that you knew you were dreaming. Uh, and you actually knew where you were physically, you know, geographically, the lo lo location. You think, right, I'm going to go back to where I live and I'm going to go up to the bedroom. Are you going to find yourself sort of asleep in your own bed? Well, but see, that's the problem. You don't get to choose. I mean, I'm sure there's some people who are in that. Free will. Somewhere got, between... got free will. I'm sorry. You've got free will in dreams to do things. Well, I know you do, but when you're when you're falling asleep, like I have a hard time falling asleep, but when I do fall asleep, uh, you know, it's it's good. It's REM sleep. It's deep sleep. And then I don't sleep that long. I wake up. I'm done. Um, I can't imagine laying there before I'm getting ready to fall asleep, trying to think of what I want to dream about because I've never. I, I have enough problems with chilling out to fall asleep that I wouldn't no way be able to do that. Um, if I was sitting there thinking about what I wanted to dream, I don't really want to yeah. dream. I, I have enough. Um, I have enough capacity in my wake, in my conscious state, my waking state, to delve into the deepest parts of my mind and think about things that are abstract or weird or whatever. Well, Lonnie, when, when you go to sleep, 
you know, it's a rest, charge your batteries up or whatever. You're not unconscious. You're still conscious. It's just a different type of consciousness to the one you have now. Conscious mind's still ticking away. When you're I, sleeping. I, I argue that. I, I would argue that. Uh, my conscious mind is turned off. My, I, I think dreams happen in your subconsciousness. I think that's the whole po point of sleeping and resting is to close oh. down the conscious thinking because, I mean you know, look at all the people, they're so tired and they want to go to bed and they go in and they lay there and they toss and turn. And that's the time when all of the things that they need to do <laughs> come into their head. You know, tomorrow yeah, I've got to take the car into the shop and, you know, and I've got to, you know, uh, get that report done for work and, and, clean the house and have dinner ready for the company that's coming. And, and their mind is just thinking about all of those things. That doesn't happen to me. I just shut it down. I say, you know, we're going into La La Land. It's time. You're tired. Shut it down. Yeah, but we, it used to be that well, way. But I've trained myself to, to do that now. Well, well, but it's, every, it's, it's a huge chunk of your life. And it's we are forcibly... Uh, made to sleep it's against against your will in some cases. You know, sometimes I don't I don't particularly want to go to sleep. But I know if I don't, I'm going to feel really shitty the next day. I could yeah. stay up all night. And it's like there is some process in the body that injects the the, the, the mind with some some, <laughs> the, some drug that yeah. forces you to actually sleep. Exactly, which is it's crazy. I mean, I mean, what sort of the, if you watch, you know, if you, if you watch movies, I I I've that have, you know, where, oh, this is the guy who's trying to save everybody. And he's, uh, you know, he's got to be, he's been trying to get everybody away from whatever the danger is. And now it's first watch. Uh, it's nighttime. You guys all sleep. I'll take first watch and, and to try to keep yourself awake for now you, maybe you're on to getting close to 48 hours or something. Um, at some point in time, whether you like it or not, it's lights out. I mean, is that conscious? Are you still conscious when that happens? Absolutely not. Not in my not in my mind. That, and so maybe you know, defining consciousness from your perspective and my perspective are two different things. I don't know. Well, Laurie, let, I'll, I'll tell you what I say: being unconscious is because I was on, I was in France, God no, forty years ago on a camping holiday uh, and this Red Cross fan came around to to collect blood so I thought oh I'll go and donate some blood and get a free coffee and a soft drink and a biscuit or whatever cookie that's what you call them isn't it and uh, I was there was this Dutch guy opposite me and he got this rubber thing in his hand and he was squeezing it and there was this bag of blood and I passed out I was unconscious then uh, and coming round from it, it was quite a terrifying experience because I didn't know where I was. When I wake up in the morning, I know where I am. But if you're waking up from being unconscious, you haven't got a fucking clue where you are because you've been, you've got your unconscious. So my my mind got traumatized by seeing this bag of blood, and I was unconscious. But when you sleep, I just think it's a different type of consciousness to, you know, your daytime hours, so to speak. That's my view. Well, okay, so so we're you know we're actually um, arguing the def definition of consciousness right now, and that's okay. But um, there is a difference between if if you went unconscious, which I has happened to me several times. It's happened to almost everyone at some point in their lives. Um, if you got moved from where you were before you went unconscious, yeah, I could see where that would be quite alarming, where you came to and you, you're like, where am I? Okay. But just waking up from sleeping, that's no, not I, that I, I, hard. The minute your eyes open, you know, you're in your own bedroom, in your own bed. And, you know, if you go on a holiday and you wake up in a strange hotel uh, for maybe uh, two seconds, you're a little disoriented because that's not the normal thing you see when your eyes open up in the morning. But 
I think that what where we're circling around to is how do we define that as part of this construct? Because if this is a it's a it's obvious to everybody it's a physical contra- construct. But there are those simulation people who say it feels like it's solid, it looks like it's solid, it acts like it's solid, but it isn't solid. Okay, so they're like matrix simulation people. But at the same time, um, the matrix simulation people are physical bodies in those pods with their brains being impacted by the matrix. Their brains are controlled by the matrix, but they still are a physical body, you know, but they're not they're they're not conscious of where they are in that pod all right now the difference between a, a that and a simulated that's a construct with a simulated matrix in in a, in a, just a simulation theory uh, none of this is actually physically real it's all simulated the earth, the people, the plants, the wind, all of it, this taste, this touch, the smell, it's all simulated. Um, I can't go for that one. Now, I might I might end up there someday. I don't know. But for now, I still say that this is a physically constructed construct. The part about you know, people put so much into the mind, the brain, how it works and and all of that. But, you know, there's a very. That's not like the most important part. The body's important, the gut, the feelings, the emotions, the spirit, the soul, all of those things. A brain all by itself is just one of the elements of the construct of the body, right? And so n- none of the whole thing could work. You couldn't have memories and consciousness and dreams and visions and all of that stuff if you were just a brain hooked up to something. So I can't go with just this is all stimulated, you know, I believe I'm in this meat suit. And I believe that my spirit, soul, energy, whatever you want to call it, is occupying this meat suit, not just its brain, its whole, its whole, the whole suit. And, and, and I believe that everything out there, I mean, when I go out and work in the garden and dig in the dirt and, and, you know, cut my plants and do all of that, this is all hard work. And I enjoy the hell out of it. And it would, it would just break my soul to think that all of that was not real. That those plants and bugs and animals and birds and everything else that I'm seeing out there aren't real. Uh, Laurie, Laurie, listen, you know, I, I, I haven't had any of the films back yet, but I did, I did three live presentations about um, these changes to reality. And one of them was in, in Lytham near Blackpool in the UK. Uh, and I was talking about the fact that the kidneys have moved from where they were to, to where they are now. They've gone up maybe six inches. You know, they used to be smaller your back, you know, uh, and now they're mostly under the ribs, which, which is crazy. Uh, but oh, I remember the audience. Is that what evolution is? No. I mean, when talking about evolution, isn't that what it's it not is? Evolution. No, it's, if, if we were physical, it, this, that couldn't happen. And anyway, I remember the audience... He shows me the scar just above his hip bone. He'd had a kidney removed a year ago, you know, but you would have made the incision, you know, just under the ribs. Okay, so you're misunderstanding. where the kidney's on it. You're misunderstanding me. They're defining evolution as the changes of the physiological everything of everything on Earth happened over millions and billions of years. That's how they define evolution. Can you yeah. not take the same concept, only the changes that are happening in this Mandela effect 
can it not also be described as a way to say, you guys call it evolution. We call it changes to the matrix. The sub matrix anyway. Changes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if that guy's kidney scar is down here, my grandmother had one of her kidneys removed when they were in the military and they were stationed in the Philippines. They had to take out one of her kidneys. And the, the, at the time, it was some, you know, exploratory experimental surgery to re just replace some tubes in there and take the kidney out. Um, and she always used to say, you know, when I was a kid, well, you don't know. You haven't been cut half in two. She was kind of a farm woman. And so that's how she talked. You haven't cut, been cut half in two. And one day I finally said, Mutter was her was her grandma name. And I said, Mutter, let me see this scar you're always talking about half in two. I want to see somebody that's been cut half in two. And she took me in the bedroom and pulled down her skirt top and pulled up her shirt top and showed me. And I'm like, holy shit, that is half in two. She was cut from her navel nearly around to her backbone, okay, to, to do this kidney work. And it was right above her hip bone. It was at her, yeah. between her hip bone and her waist. It was low. And when you showed yeah. me the pictures of where they say the kidneys are now, which is nearly up under the rib cage in the back, um, I'm like, that's, way higher than I remember them being in all my years of, you know, looking at anatomy in school and whatever. So, so is that a Mandela effect glitch in the matrix or are, are the new people coming along with kidneys in a different place or are they capable of moving the kidneys in physical beings who are already alive right now? Yes. Yes, I, I think your kidneys, oh, yeah. have, your physical kidneys have moved up six inches I in think, your own oh, body. Well, you can't see them, obviously, but um, uh, I think they have. Yeah. Well, well that, have, you you ever had, have you ever had a like a really roaring kidney infection? Yeah, I have. Yeah. I have, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I have. I mean, sent me to the emergency room. It was so horrific. I mean, awful. And. Lay here, lay up on this gurney. I can't get on that gurney. I can't move. I'm dying here. Well, let me help you. We get you up on this gurney. Now I can only get one leg and my torso up on it. I was in so much pain. And the nurse person started pushing around on my back where my kidneys were. And just about, I'm almost passed out. It was so awful. And she says, does this hurt? <laughs> which she's pushing on him. <laughs> and I literally said, yeah. fuck yes, it hurts. Stop doing that. Okay. So where she was pushing is where kidneys are supposed to be. And it wasn't up high, uh, almost under your rib cage in the back. It was low uh, above your hips. Yeah. The official medical textbooks now, you know, mainstream are telling you that the kidneys are now in this new location. So you would have to assume that that's where they are on you and myself and everybody else. Well, that's what I would like to know. The only way you would know that, though, would be to go get one of those, I don't know, MRIs or something that could show the soft tissue uh, and organs and where they are. But yeah. you, know, you posted in the Facebook group this, this morning uh, about women's reproductive organs and how how they're being moved around, not just not, I mean, not physically where they are, but forever in the history of the reproduct female reproductive system, the fallopian tubes are go around like this and, 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 and are underneath of the, or the ovaries are underneath of the, the fallopian tubes going down. Okay. And you showed these pictures of from, what did you say it was like PubMed or something yeah. uh, or whatever it was, some medical journal. Well, and then and they were seven, and they're, flipped, they're flipped upside down. They're going like this. Okay. How, how can you just suddenly after thousands of years or 
tens of thousands of years, whether you believe it one way or the other, of human anatomy, suddenly women's fallopian tubes are on the top instead of underneath on the bottom. Yeah. Well, if you anybody at home when you're listening to this, uh, go to Google Images and, and type in uh, female anatomy, uh, ovaries and fallopian tubes on the images and you look at how many different variations they are. So you've got them completely inverted uh, to what I remember them as. Uh, but there's also several other versions, um, you know, and, and some of them, you know, you've got Encyclopedia Britannica, you've got Wiki, you've got PubMed, uh, and all sorts of health groups and what have you, and you've got huge variations, but, you know, you can narrow it down to two, you know, some of the variations are small, but the new, the new version, for me, the eggs have to go uphill to get round before they can go downhill, whereas on the old version... It was downhill all the way. So maybe the new version of the anatomy is to make women less fertile because the eggs have to <laughs> defy that thing, commonly known as gravity. And we haven't got a replacement word for it in the flat earth community now. We're not flat earthers anyway. We're, you know, we're appears to be flat and, and presents itself as flat. But if, if an egg has to go uphill, travel further, it might not get there. Um, and it may reduce the world's population. I, I don't. You know? I don't know. I'm mystified by almost all of these Mandela effects. Some of uh, some of them are so bizarre. Some of them don't really matter. You know, maybe somebody's company changed their logos around over the decades, and you're just now catching on to it. I don't know, but um, the Mandela effect jumped in with kind of almost on the same railroad track or par parallel railroad track as the flat earth for, for almost about a year or so into flat earth becoming a you know conspiracy phenomenon again and and, and so they're they are tied but the, uh, to me um the whole all of it is about creating chaos, creating a sense of uh, things. Things don't fit. I don't. Things don't seem. You can't trust that you what you believe is is true or right. It's something about trust or faith. Faith challenging or. I, I don't really know what it is, why all of these things have synced in to the same sort of pipeline at the same time. And when when I first got involved in looking into Flat Earth, uh, obviously, one of the first things I did was started a website and, and bought a domain name, Flat Earth Conspiracy. Uh, the reason why that was important was because... It could go either way. It could turn out to be uh, a conspiracy to fool us or a conspiracy to hide the truth that the earth is flat and not a globe. So either way, that name was going to be stand the test of time wh wh wherever it led me. Um, so the same thing happened with the group and, and everything else. So so the name has, has worked no matter how, how the story went, but the, 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 somehow when, when I first started looking into the, the, the flat earth stuff, I started noticing right off the bat, there were things that I wasn't ever going to be able to agree with. I wasn't going to go with that. And it became sort of this thing of, well, if you're not all in, then you're not really a flat earther. You either got to be all in or you're a you might as well go back to the globe. Well, obviously you're not going to go back to the globe once you debunk the globe. Um, but also you're not, what does all in mean? All in means you're buying the dogma that everybody else has already decided is the dogma or you don't get to join the club, okay? And I don't, homie don't play that. I don't work that way. 
I, I, I'm going to always think the way that my mind and my gut tells me to think and what the evidence shows, no matter what everybody else believes. Um, so yesterday we talked a little bit about 9-11, for example, and 18 years has gone by and you've got people who believe about this one event that happened over a couple of hour span of time on one day, everything from directed energy weapons brought them down, planes brought them down, bombs brought them down. They were hit by missiles. They were, they were, you know, um, um, jet fuel melted steel beams that, you know, the whole, the, the whole gauntlet, not about who did it, why it happened, and what the consequences of it were, but the mechanical event itself, which if you could get that caught up in the mechanical event, event, and then people will say, well, but you have to know who did it and how they did it in order to get to the truth and point the finger. And and, and we were told lies. Well, these people over here don't think it was a lie. They believe the official story hook, line, and sinker and, and think that you're a conspiracy nut because you question it. And you think they're a sheeple because they don't question anything and, and believe what the authoritarians tell them they're supposed to believe, not what they saw, not what they see. So I feel that same way about Flat Earth, about the Mandela effect, about everything. You've got 10 camps in every one of these areas that are being researched, so to speak, what is research, Lawrence? I mean, how many times have you heard and seen research flat earth? Why do you think that came up? I'll tell you why. Because they already knew that the control was going to be uh, put in place of what they were going to show you on your Google search when you typed in research flat earth, right? They knew what was going to come up on well, the first well, page. I, I, well, I think there's a, there's a correlation here, Laurie, like with 9-11 with um, bringing, because the internet, had not, you know, late 90s, you know, I'm, I'm having the, the internet in about 90, 97. So the internet had only just been introduced if the internet wouldn't have been there, then all this thing about 9-11, it just wouldn't, it needed the internet for people to look into it. But That's how I found it. I mean, I, 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 only, I mean, it was what, I didn't, look, I didn't look into it until the year after. Uh, and the only reason I did, I used to work late at night selling finance and stuff. And I used to come in like, and I used to watch TV a little bit to wind down. And I, I was watching, and it got me onto uh, the fake moon landings back in 2002. And, uh, and wow, wow, you know, and I was trying, so I was telling everybody, you know, they never really went, they just pretended. And I thought, what else, you know, shortly after I thought, what else would they make up if they could lie about that? And of course, I just typed in um, the 9 11 thing. And of course, that just brought this huge explosion of all this fucking information. And that was it, you know, but without the internet, I don't, I don't ever looked at it. Well, think it, about it. Had, we, it without yeah. the internet, um, not only would, would you not be looking at a whole lot of things, you wouldn't care. The internet yeah. makes you care because it blows it right up in your face what they think they you should be looking into. or what. It, everybody who's a flat earther can honestly say that they had to hear it from somebody or they were on YouTube and they saw it over here in their suggested videos or somebody else said, you should look at this or someone, their friends on Facebook posted something about it or, or something. 99.9% .9 of flat earthers got it via a suggestion of, of some kind. Okay. Not because they just stood outside one day and said, you know what? I don't think I live on a globe. I think I, th I think this earth might be this flat pizza pan. And, you know, 
I bet you there's a dome over the top of it. And whatever you want it to be, I guarantee you, you're going to find something on the internet that supports what you want to believe, right? So the same thing with concave. I mean, I can't tell you how many flat earth friends that I had on Facebook who um, somehow right about the same time jumped over to concave and, and start making fun of the flat earthers and no, it's concave. And here's all the evidence to show that. And, and you're, and I'm like, I know what happened. It was suggested for them to look at it in the same form that it was suggested for them to look at flat earth or suggested for them to look at Mandela. If somebody had never showed you a Mandela effect instance before would, would you recognize something was changed unless somebody else suggested it to you that's the I did, I how strong suggestion is that's how hard it is to avoid it i mean my god the marketers uh you know they call it the pr people madison avenue you know the 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 great marketers of the world all know how suggestion works to get you to buy things. Well, what is, what is your worldview any different than buying into this brand or that brand or, or trying something new, a new restaurant, a new car, whatever uh, it's by suggestion and by repetition. And so I recognize that immediately when it starts happening to me. And I've actually even tried a game a couple of times by talking about something at home around my phone or devices uh, just to see how long it will take before it shows up on my news feed on Facebook trying to sell me whatever that is. Okay. And I mean, it's almost instantaneous, Lawrence. That's how quick they are. Um, you can talk about pomegranates out of out of the blue. Blah, 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 pomegranates. And before you would know it, I swear to God, you go on Facebook and they're going to be selling you pomegranate juice in your sponsored ads. Yeah. This, so, so that, so to me, that's how this Mandela effect thing happened. That's how Flat Earth happened. That's how 9-11 happened. That's how every one of these things happened. Now, the question is, who started it? Who's, whose idea was it to suggest it? Because everybody, a lot of people give credit to uh, Alex Jones for, for being the one to really promote, you know, 9-11 truth. And Whether whether he was the first one to get on there to talk about it or not, it remains to be seen because I, I remember other things than before him. But the idea of the, all of that is all sub-matrix stuff. Once you're in that, once you're connected to that sub-matrix and involved in it, it it is it's like meth or something crack i mean it's completely and utterly addicting and there's only one way to get out of it and that is to absolutely you have to disconnect you can't you can't say you know i'm a totally free human being and be connected to the sub matrix at all you can't yeah i think that I mean, probably 95% of the population are never going to wake up to what the reality is. Um, and the other 5% think they know it, but a huge chunk of those are only going to go so far. So when I say, when I say to you listeners now that there are no oil fields in the United States, there's no oil fields in Texas. They are just pretending. A lot of you are probably going to say, I'm crazy. People will say, where's all you're coming from? But I looked into it, and there's huge refining operations. I went on Google Earth and zoomed in. Huge miles and miles and miles of refining 
plants, but there ain't any oil fields there. And if you go and Google to see, a, you know, the oil actually coming out of the ground and being collected either on the land or on the sea, you're not going to see anything. All you're going to get is an animation. In fact, that, that they put out videos now to deter you for, for applying to the non-existent jobs that exist. So, for example, I sent Laurie a YouTube clip the other day, and this guy spent 12 minutes uh, telling you what to watch out for if you apply for an oil rig job. First thing he says was the drugs test. If you want to go and work on the oil rig and the oil fields, you're going to get drugs tested. So anybody who takes drugs, and there's a huge percentage of people who do, call them drugs, natural products, so they ain't going to apply. Uh, and then they, he goes on about the price of the ex accommodation and his extortion, and he's, you know, you're looking at $800 a month to share a room with three other people. And then the price of the food's astronomical if you want to eat out, and it's $5 for a slice of pizza. And there's nothing to do if you go and work in the oil fields. Uh, absolutely nothing to do. And there's no internet. This is what the guys say. There's no internet. It's cold and it's bleak. And it's very dangerous. You might lose your arm or your hand, but, you know, that's the price you pay for these these high wages. And then just to tap it all off, the, the guy would say, of course, and if you do go and work for three months on the oil fields, uh, by the time you get back, your girlfriend or your wife will have left you. And that was the whole he of was, this. He was certainly it? trying everything he could to get people to not apply for the jobs, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. did watch. It was, it was I, I obvious. It was I obvious. That video, and it, it seemed like most of the most of the work that he was doing was stocking shelves with with uh, yeah bottles or cans or whatever of oil in stores. Stocking. He was yeah. stocking. Yeah. That's not and oil he, field manufacturing, but um, you know what? That's a whole nother complete avenue of I, I it's the word evolution they, is coming into my head again Lawrence of they don't they don't want this out there no, no. No. we got I mean I've I've owned oil wells before when I lived in Indiana I had a, a part in an oil well you know you buy you buy a a share in an oil well and um I didn't, I wasn't involved in it for very long because it was one of these deals when it's really producing well, you get a nice little check. But when it's not producing, you have to pay to, you know, overhead costs, electric bill, you know, fixing the well pump head, uh, in, you know, injecting water into it to try to get the oil to come back and all of these different things. And so it ended up being not, you know, a money pipe like I thought it was going to be. So I sold my share. But there really was oil coming out of the ground. There really is oil. No, so, there isn't. There isn't, Laurie. No, there, there, there is there no is oil. There is such a thing as no, black goo no. oil coming out of the ground. I've seen no. it with my very you own might, you might have You might have seen a little bit, but we're talking about... Billions of gallons of oil no, coming no, no. out of the ground, I'm and it ain't. But I, I'm not talking about the big picture. Uh, the, it, it, I just want to make sure for those who are listening who want to go, oh, God, Lawrence has gone off on a tangent and doesn't, uh, you know, he's, he's, not, he's not saying it right. The point is, there is petroleum oil. Under, under have you actually have you actually been there physically yourself yeah, and seen I, and, and I, how, how much oil did you see standing on the on the ground when they put the well pump in okay they drill they drill 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 and then oil comes up out of the hole okay they don't set a wellhead unless that happens that they, they have to strike oil. And I have well, literally right, oil coming out of the ground. So don't just don't go quite that far to say there's no well, such well, well, right. oil. You tell me where to go and look. I, I want to go and see these oil fields in Texas be, because what, apparently there are thousands of them. Are there there no, aren't any. Wait, wait, we're screaming. Are there no oil sure. wells? Are there no oil wells in UK? 
pump no. uh, oil pumps. No, no, no. You don't have no. oil. It is, okay. It, it, it's allegedly made offshore, but all the oil oil rigs have shut down. They're just to show the few that they've got. Okay. There's no, there, there aren't, there aren't any. You go and look at the documentaries about how they bring the oil ashore. They can't show you. They just show you, uh, you know. Um, it's one of those times. Cartoons. It's really okay to argue. It's really okay to not have the same opinion. But I'm going to tell you, there is oil in the earth. Okay. I have seen it with my very own eyes multiple times. Now, are, is the oil that we're using for to fill up our cars and to put in our engines and all of that, is that the same oil coming up that's coming up out of the ground? That I, that I can't say because I don't have chain of evidence command over this oil came out of this ground, out of this well pump and was put in this tank and was taken here and refined into that, okay? I haven't followed that trail, but, and I know there are plenty of synthetic oils and I know, you know, all the ways they can make oil. What is it? Carbon and hydrogen. And so, but that's not the part where you get to say there's no such thing as, as oil in the ground because there is. So where, where all this oil that's produced in Texas, then where's it coming from? Are you saying it's coming out of the ground? There is oil coming out of the ground. Now, is right, it the same amount of oil that the world is using on a, on a daily and yearly basis? I doubt that. I definitely think there's some, you know, a lot of what is called petroleum. I mean, in reality, Lawrence, when you take your car to the gas station, and you put gas in your car, it's really gas coming out of there, okay? And it's really going into your tank and it's re the engine's really using it. Where does it originate? It's supposed to be historically coming from petroleum coming out of the ground. If it's not made from vegetables and hot whatever else, you know, there's all kinds of fuels out there. Um, jet fuel is supposed to be a version of kerosene, uh, similar to kerosene. But all I can tell you is, unless it's a Mandela effect, I literally have watched oil come out of the ground. Well, maybe I can see there's a tiny amount of oil that comes out of the ground, but a very, very tiny percentage of that. I mean, put it this way. You know, I've got my, I, sorry, sorry, I've, 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 you off just to make because I don't want to listen to the thousand comments that I get from Lawrence that doesn't get it about the oil. Well, they, they, I want them to show me where these freaking oil fields are because I can't find them, and there's none in Saudi Arabia no, either. No, now, no, Laurie, no, let me let me show no, you something. Let me say something, Mike. Right? I've put out about fifty. I've got a little YouTube channel with about thirteen hundred subscribers. I don't do anything on it myself. I just upload, apart from my presentations. And I've put about, I don't know, 40 or 50 YouTubes out. Um, and then last year, I went and doing my talks about um, the energy hoax, the power station hoax, the oil hoax, yeah? And one of them, it had been on for about six months and it had got a couple of thousand views. They weren't worried about it. And then suddenly, and I told you about it, the viewing just went through the roof and it was getting a thousand views a day. And it had a thousand views a day for about three weeks. And then it was got a worldwide ban. And I got another one. I just put a different net framework or a different title. Then I got a worldwide ban. So why is that? They're like, YouTube will let you put anything out, you know. Most well, crazy, it, I it, 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 some giants, but I'm talking about oil, you know, being a hoax out of the ground, and I get a worldwide ban. Why is that? Uh, I don't know, but I was in my 30s, late 20s, early 30s, when I bought shares in an oil well, 
And I watched them dig the well. It was a big deal. It cost a lot of money to get a share in an oil well in, in, in Indiana at the time. And I, they brought the rig in. One of the reasons why I was there was because it cost a lot of money. And I wanted to make sure that I was actually getting what I paid for and that and that it wasn't oil rig, oil shares. What was a big scam for a long time. Oh, you want to get a share in some oil wells and and people did it. And then the oil wells never happened. They said, oh, yeah, we found oil here. or We think there's oil here. and We're going to drill. And you paid all this money for for to drill it. And then, no, sorry, we couldn't find any oil there. And so I was there to watch them drill the oil well. And it was out in the country in a corn patch. I mean, you had to drive out a country road to get to it. And you had to pay, you know, part of the share thing was leasing the property for the oil rights to get the oil out of the ground. And then when you were done, you had to return it to the state in which you found it. Now, the well came in. I saw the oil. You had to build this little leakage thing of the soil berm all around the, you know, the edge of it to catch the, the oil that leaked out. Then you put the well pump on, you set the well head, and you had to bring in a tank to store the oil that was being pumped out of the ground. I saw all that. I smelled all that. It was oil. Okay. So, there is such a thing as oil coming out of the ground. Are we using it as much as we did back 50 years ago? I don't think so. Because one thing that I discovered is, number one, I remember the big scare about peak oil. We were going to hit peak oil in the world and we were going to start running out of fossil fuel oil. You notice they don't call it fossil fuels anymore. The old, the older people do, but that people know better than it coming from dead dinosaurs smashed under the pressure of the earth now. Okay. Because oil is being made. It's one of the most plentiful things on earth. And so it's not a big deal, but I think they were using the scam of all of the energy is coming from all of this oil to make more money you, you if you're going to say that you got to drill some wells and say that you're using this oil okay and that you're selling it and the value of it and why is it so expensive and on and on and on all the while you can be making free energy and selling it and screw the oil you don't really need to use it all you don't need to pump all that much of it and so now suddenly America seems to be oil independent, oil independent. When just a few decades ago, I mean, in the 70s, we had to stand, we had an oil embargo and we had to stand in line at our cars it, for to get to get gas and there was rationing. So now suddenly we're oil independent. So there is definitely something going on there, Lawrence, and that's probably why you got shadow banned uh, for for what you, you were putting out there because they don't want this issue to be talked about because then it's going to come out. Somebody is going to start going barrel by barrel by barrel because people will do shit like that and and trying to determine well how many barrels are actually coming out of the ground how many barrels are going through the refineries how many barrels are you know are are um are are being used by all of the cars out there and do those numbers jive that's not me that's one of those people who loves numbers that's not me yeah well, it doesn't stack up for me. You know, I can see that there may be a, a small amount of oil out of the ground, but a, a tiny percentage of what, what's being used. Uh, for me, they're just making it, and they always have. Um, maybe in the early days. You look at those. Somebody actually lifted one of my videos, the start of it, and it showed you 10 oil rigs all right next to each other, right? Mm -hmm. This is from the old pictures of Texas or whatever. In, it was, in America. With my very yeah. own eyes as well, a kid. Well, it's totally illogical, isn't it? Because if they did strike oil, 
they're all going down into the same pool of oil beneath them. But, so they won't make any money. They'd have to share it between all 10 of them. Okay. It's nonsense. Now I'm going to explain to you that there's different well, well depths drilled. If you find a vein of oil, it is kind of like a pool, but it seeps through the rocks to cut, to be pulled out. All right. And, or the, the rocks and sand. And so, yes, when they do drill oil wells, if they're close to each other, that's a big hit. You can afford to put a bunch of different well heads in that and pump it all into the same tanks. And, and it is less expensive. Um, those well pumps can only go so fast. You see them, you know, on the old days. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen them going, no, 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 pumping oil out of the ground. But yeah, where are they now, though, Laurie? Where are they now? Because they ain't there. The same way, Lawrence. They're not. You, you, but it's very rare for for somebody to put a, an oil well on either private property or open property. Most of the time, back in the day, when you used to see them um, out in Texas, they were in the you know flatlands. Nobody lived there. It was kind of desertish, and and but there might be some right outside somebody's back door. In Indiana, they were usually in the cornfields. Um, and you know, that all they had to do was not plant the corn in a little square area where the oil well was and the oil pump was. And, but you could drive down the same road that you drove down 40 years ago and you won't see all those oil wells anymore. So I don't know where they've gone. Most of the people would say, well, the oil dried up in that vein. And so they packed up and moved on. And they have, that's part of the deal. Yeah. When, Laurie, when Laurie, you first, abandon the Laurie, well, you have to put the land back. Laurie, Laurie, but back when they had all these, what do they call them, derricks, and there was hundreds of them all lined up next, the amount of oil they used then was probably 5% of what they do use now. They would need to be... Thousands and thousands of them to make today's oil, but there isn't. There isn't. There isn't. They're not there. They're not there, Laurie. You know, they're not there. They might, not, they might not like me talking about it, but they ain't there. You know, and if somebody wants to show me where all these are, I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll humbly say I was wrong. All right. Okay? What for me? There ain't any frigging oil, oil fields. All right. I understand your passion. And I understand that you believe that you're onto something that nobody else or hardly anybody else is onto. But let me explain the difference between then and now. Yes, we're using a lot more oil based products because we're not just using oil for uh, for our cars and our machinery plastic bags and all kinds of tires and all kinds of crap are made out of petroleum based product. Okay. And so, yes, the, the use of oil should be way more prevalent now than 50 years ago. But I, I'm not one of those people who goes around looking for oil wells lately we don't have any in Florida because we don't have oil here. Now, look at the amount of money that they spend putting these big oil rigs out in the Gulf of Mexico. Go go look for some of that. Gulf of Mexico uh -huh. oil rigs. There was uh -huh. there there the there was an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico 10 years ago that was horrific. I mean, oil pumping up out of the seabed all over the freaking place. Okay. I saw it. So I know it was coming out. I know they're pulling something out of the ground, Lawrence. You saw it on television, didn't you? No, I saw the oil. I, I've seen oil washed upon the shore. Yeah. Back in the 60s. Okay. Where'd it come from? A, a tanker that leaked. Well, that's a different oil spill from a tanker, uh, you know, the yeah. Exxon Valdez and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a whole different ballgame. Well, they well, they lie about things. If there's no they oil, lie. where where, do, where did that oil come from that is in those tankers? You're saying they're it was, manufactured, it, it was manufactured in the Middle East 
and sent over to Europe and, and the America to be processed. All right. They manufacture the crude, just, blue crude. Just, just for now. Anyway, it's good we're, to have a... We're going um, we're, we're to put a bookmark in that and we're going to move on to another subject because there's no sense arguing about it when neither one of us can show evidence to the other one. It's just what we're saying we've seen and what research we've done. Okay. But for God's sakes, it, it absolutely is true that oil comes out of the ground. It absolutely is true that certain machinery is using oil-based products. But now the third part that is at question here is, is that the same oil that's coming that we were told it's been coming out of the ground or are they making it from some, something else, some other means in the meantime? Okay. Standard oil and the big oil companies are some of the, are the wealthiest corporations on earth. Okay. Now they made all that wealth by selling oil and power to people right? The standard oil and those big companies sell oil, petroleum yeah. products to the world. Yeah, but I mean, look, 1925, Fisher Trops, but they figured out how those, prior to that, they made synthetic oil in the 1920s. I know that. So it's all going to be synthetic, isn't it? Once you can make it, why would you I'm spend really billions of dollars get, trying to prospect it. for it and get it out of the ground? You wouldn't do it, would you? You just make it. Of course, you would make it. There would be no reason to pump it into the ground and then pump it back out again just to make people no, think you, that it's a you, you know a rare so, commodity yeah. source. So they're pretending. They're pretending, like like Apollo. You know when the Apollo mission takes off. I was watching some of the old old ones. There was a Mandela on one of them. The guy who did all the commentaries from it. He was calling it Apollo Seven when it was Apollo Eight or something like that posted it on the page and then you see the rocket taking off which i'm not even sure whether that's real and then it says it shows you the other one animation of the rocket separating into the first bit and the second bit well that's the same with the oil you want to look at how it's all done they don't show you anything real it's all animation and when i when, when you see animation it means the whole, for me the whole thing is fake just like the apollo missions well fake. okay the well pump that I saw and the oil coming out of the ground when I was younger was not an animation, but that's been a long, long time ago. And I haven't been involved in the oil business since then. So I'm, I, and I, and I haven't actually been out West to the areas where there would or should be a bunch of those oil wells everywhere, because now they're replaced with those big wind turbines or big solar fields or something else than than oil because it is very costly to pull oil out of the ground it really is but not in comparison to some of this other stuff that you know yeah it's pretty cheap to build solar now but 50 years ago it wasn't i mean that was a hot new thing that it was real expensive to get solar panels the point of the matter is um each and every one of these kinds of things, this one seems to matter to you a whole lot more than it matters to me, this particular one. This one doesn't have the jazz for me that it uh, apparently does for you. Mandela Effect hasn't had the jazz for me at all. Uh, I've listened to other people talk about them and I have investigated ones that people have pointed out to me, but it, it you know, we each, to our own, have our own interests. And it just doesn't happen to be one of mine. Um, but the only time that I argue with you, Lawrence, is when I have evidence or opinion or knowledge of something contrary to what you say or believe. But that doesn't mean that you're wrong or that I'm right or that both of us aren't right, okay? We can both be right on this particular issue, whether or not they're still using the oil that's coming out of the ground um, is a moot point. 
is the oil coming out of the ground? All of the oil that they're telling us we're using, is it all coming out of the ground? Or is it being manufactured in some other way? And they're trying to make us think that it's such a hard resource to come by and why it's so expensive is because it's coming out of the ground. Do you see what, what I'm saying there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if it's not all coming out of the ground and they're making it some other cheap way and selling it to us as if it were, then that pisses me off. That, that pisses me off. And if there is such a thing as free energy in the atmosphere, and we know that there is, um, why that technology isn't being used for everyone everywhere, the whole world would change overnight if suddenly everyone got free power. All the, all the free electricity you could use for whatever you wanted to use it for. And it would really piss me off if... The big manufacturing, uh, big conglomerate, huge corporate monstrosity businesses out there were getting fucking free power. And that's why they were making so much profit. And then us little yo-yos are out here all paying 160 or $200 a month for an electric bill to keep our houses barely cool and warm. So therein lies where I would... Once I get pissed off about one of those kind of lies um, and, and, and knowing that these underdeveloped countries could have had the opportunity to take care of themselves and get out of poverty and manage their affairs as well as a, a you know, a forward moving company, an economic big co country like United States or Britain um, and they've been held back on purpose, that would piss me off. See, stuff like that pisses me off. Not the underlying lies, but I understand exactly why you're digging into it, so to speak. Well, this is about uh, two years for you on digging into this energy thing. Well, um, I mean, the other big one, and you may not be interested in, but maybe the viewers are or listeners is that in your house you've got a consumer unit where the electricity comes in and they measure the electric comes in and okay, you get billed Oops, sorry we call that a meter all right so you get billed on what comes through the through the meter yeah okay. you get billed on that and that electricity like a river it flows through the house it goes through the wires in your appliances and then it goes back out down another wire back into the grid and is reused and it just gets slowed down a little bit the electricity is not you cannot destroy energy it just circulates around the house and it goes back into the grid but you don't get a rebate for that that goes back you get billed for everything that comes in yes. that's what's happening that's what's happening then that, that's why they shut so many power stations down because they're bogus anyway you know, and um, the, the electricity can't be destroyed. It's energy. Well, I'll give you an example of um, I have some friends. I they they have this is their second home here in in where I live. They have another home up north that they spend the summer up there and they spend the winter down here, otherwise known as snowbirds. And I watch their house in the summer when they're up north. And they put in this whole roof system of solar panels this this past uh, spring. And they have a metal roof on their house. We call it tin roof, but it's a, you know, a metal roof completely covered with solar panels on the back side away from the street where you can't see them. And they went from paying about anywhere from $350 to $450 a month to power this big house. This is a nice big house. Lot, it's three air conditioning units, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So I don't know what they spent to have all these solar panels put in. But last month's bill, now this is Florida, 90 plus degrees every day. 80s at night, humid as hell, 
I mean, 100 percent humidity most of the time. Three air conditioning units going. Now, they're not living there, but all of those are keeping it at 78 degrees. Their bill was ten dollars. Yeah, Do you well, know what $10 I, I, represents, Lawrence? $10. That $10 okay. represents the minimum amount that the power company charges you per month to keep hooked into their system. Well, I mean, we're, our weather is nothing like yours. We don't get anywhere as much, you know, relative sunshine as what you do. But in the UK, solar power was really taking off and it was costing, in your money, it was costing about um, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars for uh, for to put solar panels on a on a four bedroom detached house. Uh, but we had something over here called a feed-in tariff. So any electricity that you didn't use, it got fed back into the grid, and you got paid money for every kilowatt or whatever it is uh, that got back in. So over the course of a year. For that size property, you would get back around two thousand eight hundred dollars payment into your bank accounts, paid quarterly. Obviously, you get more in the summer than in the winter because there's more sunshine. So you get virtually free electricity in the summer, um, and not very big bills in the winter. And the, these were self-funding in four years. Right. They were paid, well, but they have amazing. a life. They have a lifespan of twenty-five years. Uh, and all the payments are index linked, so they go up every year. So right. it was a complete no brainer. Germany is the biggest user of solar panels in the world residentially. So, over where you are, with the amount of sunshine you get, you know, if they're installed at a similar cost, you'd probably get your money back in about two and a half years. Right. So, so there's no brainer to do it if, if you get the incentives to do it like you did over here. The point is, if they were paying $400 a month, and they ended up paying $10 a month, that means they were metered for $400, okay? But yeah. they produced $400 back, so they yeah. zeroed out, okay? In yeah. my opinion, if what you're, if the way that you described electricity when we first talking about this, if all you're doing is using it and it's going back into the, you know, it's it, it doesn't go away. Okay. You just use off of it. And then what the hell are this just proved another thing. If, if it should be free, but you're pay, being paid, you're being billed by metered kilowatt hours. Right. Yeah then if their solar house is producing enough power to not use any from the power company, they should be getting the $400 plus paid for $400 worth plus paid $400, not zero now. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, it's just another layer onto the scam because they paid probably 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars for the amount of solar panels and installation and the whole electrical grid thing that they had to put in to convert the solar power to the you know meter to the house to the whatever. I, I, I'm not I'm not exactly sure how it all works, but the point of the matter is, you know, it's supposed to be a, such a good investment that you'll get your money back when it should have been free in the first place. All of it. The, the, yeah. the state of Florida should be putting, forget the electric generating uh, nuclear power plants and everything else they've been, they've gotten, they're using. Why not use solar on everybody and just charge them more? a little bit or or just give them a little break but no that's not how it works that's not what utility companies are all about so yeah it's just it's just another layer of the lies of the matrix lawrence it's 
it, it, they're all tied yeah, I, together. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what else. I know these might not rock your boat, but uh, I was looking, I, I did some measurements. Uh, I was looking at these um, Airbus A380s. And these these planes actually come in and like they ho they're like hovering and they come in and land like a bird, and the back in the eighties and nineties the runways the runways had to be two miles long because it took that long for them to stop. Now these planes come in, and when they're coming in, it's like that it's like they're just hovering like a bird. And when they when they touch down, they're stopping in about a thousand meet. They could stop sooner. They're stopping in a, in a like quarter of the of a runway, and it's it's like this is this is new technology because planes never used to do that. I because I've I've been on planes and, and they stop so soon in the old days. You know, you take up most of the bloody runway to get it to stop. And it, oh yeah, it, I mean, it's pretty. Um, the I've been on, you know, I flew this spring up to see my mother. I don't even remember it was. One was a fairly large plane. The other one, two, were small, pretty small. And it felt like the small planes needed more runway to take off and land than the big one did. They do, yeah. And, but I don't know. Maybe they've added some, what is that that we were talking about, about the bumblebees and the levitating? Yeah, the these planes, they are levitating. These, levitating. these big jets, they are, they are levitating, yeah. They are. I mean, somebody's, somebody's, put some, somebody's put footage out of these planes standing still in the air. I don't know whether it's real or not, but I've seen the video of it. You know, well, and they, the, speed it of, the speed in which they uh, fuel up these planes with these little bitty hoses that they hook in. Oh, okay, well, yeah. It's about this big. And there's like you know, the little truck that pulls up. With, with the fuel and the hose and the, and you're like there's not a lot of fuel going in there and you know we've all we've talked about this on the other videos quite a bit uh how much fuel planes are actually holding versus what they used to say they hold and you know the full of fuel wings and all that stuff it's another one of those parts that goes back to 9-11 um the, they don't if load. they actually were planes that hit the buildings, which they weren't, but if they actually were, um, the, there wasn't enough jet fuel on those planes really? to, to burn a couple of floors, much less melt steel beams and make the whole thing collapse. Yeah, hey, Laurie, hey. I've, I've, I mean, I've been to the Canaries God knows how many times, you know, I've been to the probably about 30 or 40 times maybe. But obviously, since I've been into this, I've been paying very close attention as to what happened. So the plane bringing the holidaymakers over to the Canary Islands, it, it's in, right? The passengers are coming off, the baggage is off. And while the people are coming off, we're lined up to go straight on. They don't get refueled. No refueling done at all. You just get straight straight on. There's no fuel. And this right. is a little tiny island anywhere. They haven't got well, anywhere that's, to store all this fuel. That, that's that's actually not that unusual because um, when when I went to, gosh, St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, um, it's a pretty small island, really, all things considered. And the first thing you do is you take off and you go over to somewhere like Puerto Rico and fuel. That's the first thing you do. You take off and you go right over there and you fuel up and then... And, and the same thing uh, flying into there. They don't want planes full of fuel to crash. So, you know, you you should be pretty close to running out of fuel by the time you get there to land because they don't want planes blowing yeah. up. And it's not a very nice long runway either. I mean, it's kind of yeah. like you drop out of the sky and they, there you are. So, well, I'm sat there with my beer, Laurie. I'm sat there with my drink, watching every move on this plane. No fuel going on. All the passengers are off. I'm on the plane back. No fuel. But th they tell you that they fuel enough for the journey, plus a small margin in case yeah. they have to circle well, a few times. Say, but that, yeah. but that's, this can't be true. I've heard, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard all these things, too. You know, the part about 
questioning everything is at some point, somebody's going to tell you the truth, right? Can't everybody be lying about everything? God, well, I, hope yeah, I, mean, I hope not. I really, really hope not. But you know. at some point, you got to find some truth somewhere that there's no need for a lie. Okay. Yeah. How, does any, how does anybody figure anything out? A lie attached to it because then that would say that nothing is the truth, nothing is real. And what a place to, what a world, what a world, what a world. <laughs> the wicked well, give me, give, give me some truth. Give me some truth that's shared by, give me something that the mainstream tells is actually true. You know, give me one thing off the top of your head. So give me something that's true. It's real you hard. Think you it's real hard you? to do. I, don't, you know? don't get me wrong. It's real hard you know? to do. I you mean, know, like the, is, like the, for the like the frigging America, America, America. This is America. This is America for you, Laurie. They the pro, they yeah. prosecuted the people who make cherries for saying cherries are good for your health. You can't make claims saying cherries are good for your health. No, it's, because it's, it's just it's unbelievable. Medicine. You can't say that. Practicing medicine, and you have to have a license for that. You can't say it's good for you. Well, okay. But you can all this. Sh we can put all this shit in the products, and as long as you get a you know permission to do it, you can put as much shit as you like in the in the American food and let them eat it. Well, listen. But let you me tell you. Natural. Oh, do you know the American? Hold on. I, 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 I don't buy almonds from California, where they come from anymore, because they're all pasteurized. Well, when I buy almonds, I say I don't yeah. want any of those American rubbish. And I don't, buy, I don't buy American uh, sweet potatoes because they've all been coated with chemicals to stop them rotting. But they're nearly all from the USA in our supermarkets, the, the okay. sweet potatoes. Okay, Jimmy came home with some grass-fed beef, pasture-raised grass-fed beef in a package. And first thing I did was I looked on the back of the package for for the ingredients what's in it i swear to god beef yeah that's all it said ingredients yeah. beef yeah i'm like damn i haven't seen this from no salt no water no monosodium glutamate for for preserve no no nothing beef that's all it said and and yeah. i mean you that that is coming as close from the farmer as you could possibly get. Farm to table is beef. All right. So I know the problem is you you know yeah you can say beef. Did the farmers put anything in their food? Did the farmers inject them with any vaccinations? Did the farmers accidentally let them eat a few? bits of some kind of fertilizer from something on the grass and blah blah okay you can't unless you raise and reuse your own seeds and 100% control your your growth of everything you put in your mouth these days and that would include a hermetically sealed cover over <laughs> Whatever this is, you're growing, um, and and a uh, what do you call it? Clean room to enter it and exit it because you got shit falling out of the air. You got fumes puking by by cars. You got you know the whole thing. There, there's no way to eat pure or anything these days. You can get as close as you possibly can, but there's no pure. There's no, you know untainted anything yeah well you, you certainly if you're buying it from the supermarket because there's there's all there's organic and there's supermarket organic and the or, supermarket organic is industrial so yeah. they they can put uh, antics on apples and pears and still call them or, or, organic well crazy the, the the label organic obviously has been bastardized over over all the years but originally when it started it was a good concept and 
you know, back years ago when I first started buying organic food, it, it wasn't really that much different than buying straight from the farmer who you knew didn't use chemicals on their fields or on their animals. I mean, to me, chemicals are vaccinations, any antibiotics, anything that you put in that isn't just eating the grass is, um, is tainted. But again, to me, that's when, that's when I said earlier that you, you can't truly be out of the sub matrix in today's world unless you're, you know, in the Amazon or <laughs> some, I mean, there's very few places left on earth that there isn't Wi-Fi signals going over your head or planes or cars or, or sub matrix taint. There's very few places left on earth. That's like that. And, and they, and you know, they make it sound like these undeveloped countries, these underdeveloped countries. It's like, please save a few of them just in case. Just save a couple of them undeveloped, you know? Because yeah. it's a day when, you know, people are going to wish that we hadn't come this far, that we hadn't gotten into all this factory farming and factory everything and factory lifestyle. We all live a factory lifestyle in one form or another. Uh, well, tell me, like, because I mean, I only went to America once, and you know, took my kids at the time, and we went around all the theme parks. But well, I mean, the thing that amazed me, if you bought a normal portion, it would be enough to feed three people. A child's portion was enough to feed two of us. And I went to one of these restaurants. It was just like that one in uh, Pulp Fiction where they, they sat in these cars and they've got these celebrity, well, lookalikes, you know, going around right. doing that. And uh, and I ordered this nachos and cheese. And I'm not kidding. They brought, they brought a plate out and it was, the plate must have been two foot long and one foot, and it was piled up like that. And the guy put it in front of me. I mean, oh, you could have fed six people with that. And I said, I said you cannot be serious. That's you cannot be serious. I'm not going to read all that. Story, your story is hilarious to me as an American because you did everything people are told is American to do when you came here. But it's yeah. not what anyone would do if they were on vacation in America. Except if yeah. they had kids and family. Number one, you don't go to the theme parks because they suck. Okay. They're just zoos. And you don't go to places where you eat nachos and cheese, much less for six people. Because if you have the opportunity to go on a vacation, a nice vacation in America, and you're American, you're going to go find some place where there are no people, as few people as you possibly can. Or if you're me, you're, you're going to do that anyway. And you, you're not going to go to one of those themed parks and you're not going to go to a theme restaurant. So you got sucker punched into what it is to go to a vacation in America. But yeah, well, that, I was, I mean, course, we, the, we did the Ripley's Believe It or Not and all that sort of stuff. And large, the, Jaws. the portions are large. But look at the people in America. Used to be, you could go back and look at pictures of America in the 70s, and you might see 5% um, overweight people or otherwise known as obese, depending on how much overweight they are. You might see 5 or 10% tops in the 70s. You, you go and just take a snapshot of America now, and... At least half, if not more, are overweight or, ob or obese. And there's the exact reason why. Because they're Americanized. People are ruined. They're getting ruined here. They're filling them full of chemical, uh, uh, you know, medic medicines, pills for everything. Oh, well, now I got side effects from there. Well, let me give you a different pill to take care of the side effect from the other pill. And 
instead of saying, well, maybe we should stop taking the first pill, let's give you another pill for the side effect. The, the GMOs, the crappy food, the processed everything, you know, uh, and you can just go on and on and on. We're being poisoned. We're poisoning ourselves. So thank God it's a construct because if it weren't, um, we would probably, we should, I don't even know why we don't have negative population growth in the United States right now. We should have negative population growth. You I mean, should, I think it's something have... 3,500 people or 6,000 people or some crap like that die in America every day. Yeah. I don't know how many babies are born, but I mean, we still have. I know. I'm, I'm, Laura, you, you Americans, growing. not you, but. Not you personally, but you Americans, you're always complaining about the price of gas. Now, when I was in America, I, I'd got I got a big, big Jeep type station wagon, you know, with four wheels at the back and two at the front, huge thing. And I've been driving around for a week, so I thought I better put some some gas. We call it petrol. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill it full of gas. Now I went to this petrol station, and you had to pay up front. So I thought, well, I don't know. I'm just gonna put thirty dollars in, you know which is not much, you know. Uh, anyway, so I'm filling it up. $17. It's, all, all, it's totally full. And I've done, I've done huge mileage. But that same Jeep in the UK would probably cost you um, $200 to fill up. I mean, the you know, we a price, a price, uh, we, we a, don't. Ga a gallon of gas over here now is like uh, $8. So what damage do you pay? How much is a gallon of gas? Uh, I fill my car up so seldom because I don't drive it that much. Um, I think it's in the 250-ish range. Well, there you go. I mean, you know, we haven't seen 250 since the 1980s. Well, so, yeah, we bitch about it because we're one of the largest consumers of petroleum products in the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We drive more cars, more gas-guzzling cars, all that stuff. I never have really been too much of a bitter about the price of, of fuel, but my life's long enough where I remember as a very young teenager, the, you first got your, your driving license at 16 years old, the girls would all pile in the car and go out and just cruise the car and stop and get yeah. burgers and go see all your friends everywhere. Each one of us put in a quarter, uh, 25 cents, a piece at the beginning yeah. when we got in the car, each of us pitched yeah. in a quarter and that got us four or five gallons of gas. It was 25 yeah. a gallon when yeah. I was a young teenager. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that was before the oil embargo and the peak oil and the, all the other crap, but it wasn't long after that. I mean, it was shot up and there used to be petrol stations on all four corners of an intersection in certain parts of town, standard oil over here, SO over here, shell oil over there, and uh, uh, and they competed against each other and had gas wars, lowering, lowering, lowering the price to get everybody to come to their station. Okay. So, you know, things are a lot different now than they were back then. But the, the, the things that Americans focus on um, and bitch about um, are really pretty upside down for for what they should be bitching about, and because they're 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 most of them are sheeple, and their suggestions they're suggested to be concerned about these things, <laughs> and yet all these other things over here they don't la 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 they don't seem to pay that much attention to. So anyway. All right, I'm yeah. going to um, wrap this up unless you have something new you want to add in for part three. No. I think we got a couple hours here. Yeah, um, well, I need to do some digging for some something interesting to okay. remind well, people I, of. Or, I think you know, it's been an interesting conversation. When you and I get to yelling at each other over the microphones, <laughs> that, you know, oh. but that it's actually uh, challenging because neither you or I are the type to get mad. It, you know, that doesn't mean we're mad at each other. We're just in, you know, intensity's coming out. And um, yeah. so for those of you listening, 
who aren't able to see our faces because you're listening to it by podcast. Um, big hugs over to Lawrence and uh, nobody's mad here. So yeah, uh, we will. We will. We can have a we can have a heated discussion without falling out. Yeah, so, that's true. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well. Um, Thank you, Lawrence, and for sharing your time with well, me. Yeah, well, that's thing in, in England now. There's there's forty schools in England, forty schools. Where